move to the next person, uh, Mercy Philip, assistant professor and research scholar uh, in higher education, uh, this college of higher education, Dimapur. So the topic for uh, his, uh, you know, uh, discussion is the early Moran system in Nagaland, and he's going to speak with special reference to Sumi tribe. So I, I'm sure it's going to be very, uh, you know, interesting session. So let us begin with the speaker. So I, I'm sure he's there. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. I'm here. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, I just begin. I don't have sharing of the screen because Nagaland, we don't have so very good net facilities. So I just like to present the paper only. All right. Go ahead, please. The early Morung system in Nagaland and its relevance today with special reference to Sumi tribe. Nagaland became the 16th state of the Indian Union in 1963. It's mainly inhabited by various Naga tribes. The Nagas are a tribal indo mongoloid people who live in the northeast region of India. In the state, there exist 17 recognized tribes and then a number of sub-tribes. The Nagas were a warlike people who engaged in headhunting raids on each other, on Nagas across the border in Burma, and on the people of the lowlands. The Morung, which means dormitories for young bachelors, served as the training Sundays, barracks, and Sundays for ceremonial purposes, where skulls and other wood carvings were displayed. It's a vital institution that taught each villager the important virtues of life and the way of living. This system was common to all the Naga tribes, even if other social, political practices or certain details of the practices weren't very identical. Morung in Sumi Naga culture. Sumis are one of the major Naga tribes in Nagaland, India. They are found predominantly in the districts of Sunabuto, Dimapu, Tinsang, and are sparsely distributed in other districts as well. In the past, they were brave warriors whose status was determined by the number of kills, the number of fees of merit, and bloodline. They were known for their aggressiveness, yet easy to reconcile nature. Like other Naga tribes, Sumis also treasured Morong as one of the socio-cultural institutions where the youth were taught the fabric of their culture and responsibility of defending their tribe and culture from all attacks and to preserve it as taught by the elders of the village. A Sumi Naga elder says that the Morongs are very special to them and the inscriptions on the Morong signify unity, wealth, prosperity, warriors, bravery, and the ancient worship of stars and rainbows before the coming of Christianity. Apuki in Sumi dialect, which means the male dormitory, was very popular among the Sumi people. On the day of construction, every villager was required to be present in the village. Women were not allowed to come near the construction site nor touch the raw materials. After the completion of the construction of the dormitory, a big pig would be killed and every man would eat the cooked meat. However, women were not allowed to taste it. The dormitory was a learning institute where the Sumi norms and customs were taught to young bachelors. They were also taught how to fight, how to use the spear, bow and arrows, and how to be a good artisan. It was the duty of the inmates to guard the village and announce the approaching of enemies. Besides the male apuki, the male dormitory, each village had iliki, a dormitory for unmarried young girls as well. Young girls were taught singing, dancing, weaving, and other feminine tasks and household work there by the elderly married women. Morung today in Sumi society. Time and season may change. Traditional societies may give way to modernity, and this is of no exception to the tribes of Nagaland. 
But with all this, the traditional values and culture can't be turned over as it is the lifeline and lifeblood of the Nagas. External changes with regard to the culture may be visibly felt in the lifestyle of the Nagas, but the relevance of the traditional values which forms the soul of tribal life in Northeast India cannot be wiped out. It may not be taught to the younger generation through the organized social institution called Morung, but the teaching imparted in the Morung is still very relevant to the Naga tribes with no exception to the Sumi tribe. The establishment of schools have led to the disintegration of dormitories or Morung among the Sumis. One reason for its decline is the influence of Christianity, which has brought about new concepts of belief from that of their traditional belief and of the establishment of schools by the early missionaries, which turned the attention of people from Morung to school as the center of learning. Writer V. V. Rao gives two reasons for the decline of the Morung in Naga Hills. Firstly, headhunting was banned, and secondly, Hostilities amongst tribes have come to a stop. So, the guarding of the village from enemies by the youth are no longer required as in the days of old. It is observed from the data furnished from the field that Morung, which was their social life center, does not exist among the Sumi tribes anymore. Neither do the dormitory for girls exist. Both have not just not just declined but have totally faded away and is almost forgotten by the Sumi tribe. Modernization has taken its toll on the traditional institutions, but it is seen that even without this morung, people are well knit and are united, and tribal values are imparted to the younger generation. Morung was never a well structured organization but it was more of seeing and learning. So even without Morung, the interactions between the young and elderly continues. The young has the opportunity to learn the customs, traditions, and values pertaining to their culture during many social, cultural, religious, and festive gatherings in the village where the whole village takes part. Younger generation seeks the advice and guidance and support from the elder ones even today so whatever was imparted to the young in Morong, directly or indirectly imparted to the young ones today by examples or as lived experiences. Morong taught the youth the virtue of dignity of labor and hard work. However, dignity of labor seems to elude the younger Naga generation. As a result, there is a huge problem of educated, unemployed youth in Nagaland. In Morung, skills like handicraft, wood carving, spinning, weaving, embroidery works, stitching, cooking, rice brewing, etc. were taught. The modern education system and hopefully the NEP 2020 will adopt the institu and institutionalize these skills to reduce the problem of unemployment among the Sumi tribe youth and the youth of Nagaland. In Morong, elders of the village taught the boys of various medicinal plants, like while sitting near the fireplace. Every Naga tribe has traditional knowledge of medicinal plants. The younger generation needs to document this traditional knowledge. Morong was the military training center for the young boys, where the art of warfare and the spirit of patriotism were taught in defense of their society. An inculcation of these two aspects of the present day curriculum and to high school, uh, that is high school and higher secondary education, will great, uh, in a great way pave way to help the youth to inculcate and perceive, preserve the sense of patriotism. In conclusion, I would like to say that in the present day, the Morong can be summarized as the club, the public school the military center, the hostel for boys and girls, and a meeting place of the village elders. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, sir.
Thank you, uh, Mercy. Uh, I just, uh, you know, a little bit intrigued by the fact uh, where, uh, you know, Morang uh, is basically you stated that it's it's a part of your culture. Yes, so sir. I just uh, I'm, I'm a little bit intrigued by the fact to what extent it uh, contribute to to the uh, to the, you know, the the, uh, you know, female section of the society. How does it, uh, you know, uh, contribute to women at large? How do you see uh, that? For the traditionally, the women also had uh, the young girls, unmarried girls also had this uh, morung system, which they mm -hmm. call in semi like it is uh, applicable to all the tribes everyone had. But right now, practically, most of the tribes do not have this, uh, neither for men nor for women. Actually, for young girls, it was a great help because as part of the culture of the Nagas, they have their traditional attires. It is in this place that the girls were given training in weaving, knitting, and uh, other handicrafts. And mm -hmm. the girls would make uh, gifts for their uh, partners, boyfriends uh, in that place. And the elderly woman, evenings after their household chores, they would go to that place. Uh, it will be taken care of by some elderly married women and they would train them. This is especially when there were no schools. Schools came to notice, of course, quite late and like other places. So one, so it was the training like a school for them to train them how to live their life ahead, for a, especially for a married life. Right. So, you know, if we just talk in, let us say, in general, uh, to present context or contemporary context, we can see that there are so many thing, things which, you know, make us uh, see things from different spectacles, right? And to a large extent, we can see that there is a loss of many things with the advent of technology or science to a large extent. So yes. how do you see, you know, is it, con is it good or is it good to go with the, 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 the you know, traditional setup or let us say the, the cultural, you know, setup which you believe, uh, you know, Morangi is representing. So is uh, it? Uh, sir, uh, actually I'm not a Naga, but I have been in Naga for several years. Uh -huh. But my own experience of being in education institutions, being in their culture, I uh -huh. strongly feel that there should be a blend of the modern and the traditional. Uh -huh. Because there are a lot of beautiful practices and uh, beautiful knowledge which is slowly getting disintegrated. And mm -hmm. if the tradition is not uh, um, preserved or the if there is no preservation of the modern, um, old with the new, gradually even uh, their basic values will be eroded. Even oh, the okay. culture, the dress code and a lot of things, it is so beautiful. But it mm -hmm. can be already there is a lot of uh, damage is done. Uh, some trying to give away, give it up altogether, especially the younger generation attracted, especially they go out of the setup for studies and education and come back and uh, they hardly know their language properly and even the customs, cultures, etc. And there is no social setup like the Morong system for them to learn. It's only what they see in some social gatherings, some church gatherings, some village gatherings, what they see and they learn. And most of the time, those young people who are out of the village, out of the state are not even seeing that. So mm -hmm. it's very important that they need to find out some ways of blending or meeting these both modern and traditional um, lifestyle and uh, technology, etc. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for you know making this uh, so much generative. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. So any 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 other presenter has question, so they can ask if there there is anybody with the question. Yes. No. All right. So let us move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker we have is going to speak on negotiating identity and. Uh, uh, name is Wazid Aziz, research scholar, University of Jammu, right? And is going to speak on Minaret by Laila Abu, Abu Lailas, right? So he's going to discuss on the importance of Islam. All right. So do we have Wazid Aziz? No. Yes. No. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so the next speaker we have Rajshri Killer. Is is she available? Okay. She, okay. Yes. Yes, sir. I am here. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, sir. All right. So Hello? Uh, yes, Shri, please yes. introduce us with your topic, and then we will uh, move. Yes. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. yes. Hello, sir. Good evening. Yes. Good evening, Rajshri. Sir, wait a my... minute. So am I audible? I am uh, Wajid Aziz from Jammu and Kashmir, from Jammu Institute Research Scholar of English Department. All right. Uh, Wajid, we can start with your paper after, you know, Rajshri finishes it up. All right. Will that be fine? Okay, oh, oh, okay sir. Okay, sir. All right. All right. Okay. Yes, Rajshri, uh, uh, you can go ahead with your paper. Yes, so you're yes, going to yes. speak on, uh, yes, sir. on uh, you know, it's very interesting topic. I can see she's been pursuing her PhD from Mahatma Gandhi Central University, right? And yes, the, yes, top, yes, sir. the topic is perceptions and presumptions of healthcare seeking behavior among uh, Mankedia tribe Man in Mankedia Mankedia tribe Mankedia in tribe. 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 Odisha. Right. All right. So yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. I am I am presenting with PPT, sir. All right. Okay. Go ahead. So who is are who you sir? are working with? Who is your supervisor over there? Sir, uh, Dr. Shweta, ma'am. Shweta, Dr. Oh. Shweta. All right. Dr. Shweta Tripathi. Tiwari, ma'am, sir. All right. Okay, okay. Go ahead, please. Is it visible, sir, my PPT? Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Now I am going to present my paper entitled Perceptions and Presumptions of Health and Care Seeking Behavior Among Mankaria Tribe in Moirbhan District, Odisha. Health is an essential aspect of culture, and health behavior, perceptions, and beliefs of people are interrelated with culture. Its attitudes specify how individuals perceive various health problems and how their understanding of knowledge towards their health represents the health culture of society. The ancient Indian surgeon Sushruta defined health as prasanna mandriya manishrastha, means Health is a state of happiness and a feeling of spiritual, physical, and mental well-being. The idea of health is a valuable way to understand the medical systems of the indigenous people, which is based on the sociological understanding of social interaction, group, organization, and how the attitudes, behavior, and social organizations are influenced by social context and social environment. Yes, Albert quoted Clement's view of the healthcare system as totality of this interrelationship, which suggests the experience and response to illness are intertwined within individual and institutions in each culture. He argued that some people decide their healthcare treatment pattern of behavior should be followed in various circumstances like what, when, where, and how. The sociocultural economic system Geographical environment, religious beliefs, and methods are significant concerns for understanding the tribal health system, which also influences health-seeking behavior among the tribal community. Then particular vulnerable tribal group of Odisha. Odisha is home of many tribal communities. As per government records, 62 tribal communities reside in the state, of which 13 are placed on the list of particular vulnerable tribal groups based on their geographical isolation, declining population, low literacy rate, poor living conditions, and isolation from mainstream society. The 13 PBTG are Kutia Kandha, Lanjia Saura, Chuktia Bhunjia, Paudi Bhunya, Lodha, Hilkhadiya, Mankedia, Birhar, Juang, Bonda, Didai, Dangoria Kandha, and Saura. Mankedia is one of them. The Mankedia tribe is a semi-nomadic section of Birhar tribe that dwells primarily in Similpal Tiger Reserve Forest and other places in Moirbhan district. They also reside in Kalahandi and Sundargarh district. They are considered one of the most primitive tribal groups and wandering communities which move from one place to another depending on the convenient season. Then my objective is based on to understand the perception of health and factors affecting health care seeking behavior among Mankadia community. In this study, the data was gathered through both primary and secondary sources. The preliminary data were collected from the field with the help of a field visit. The researcher followed interview schedules and face-to-face -face interview techniques using semi-structured questionnaire. 
In this study, the researcher used a homogeneous purposive sampling method for collecting the houses from the villages of the Mankiria tribe. As a simple, I collect information from the tribal people. In Mankiria's views, good health is free from diseases, symptoms, signs, and problems and can work in daily life. Good health is the blessings of God who regulates the body and mind of a man. They also believe that a person may be physically well but mentally not fit. Mental well-being is understood in terms of perceiving socially well-expected behavior. However, the general concept of Mankadia about being healthy is associated with being free from any diseases and both physically and mentally strong. Perception of disease among Mankadia community. Generally, Mankadias have two types of perceptions, traditional and modern perceptions. Tra traditional perception towards their health and care-seeking behavior is concerned with superstition belief and herbal-based folk medicine. Magic religious treatment is core part for their traditional perception, which influenced by beliefs, customs, and traditions of their community. Nowadays, the per perception towards the health and disease is under transformation. They are getting rid of many superstitious beliefs and developing their health consciousness and tending towards the modern notions of health and disease. Three major reasons are behind the transformation of their perception, education, conversion to Christianity, and connection with the modern world. Though Mankadias are not well educated, the younger generation who completed school and college education know the modern medical system and its usefulness and effectiveness. The conversion to Christianity is one of the main reasons for transmitting their traditional perception of the healthcare system into the modern medical system. Christian missionaries spread awareness among them regarding health issues and informed them of the impact of modern treatments and the destructive effects of superstitious belief. Connectivity with mainstream societies or the modern world also enhanced their knowledge of modern medical science. For the sake of livelihood, many Mankadias are migrating to the big cities where they interact with the current system of medical practices and observe usefulness and effectiveness. There are various, there are various factors affect the health system and care-seeking behavior among the people of Mankadia. These are socioeconomic condition, social environment, culture, income, social status, employment, and working conditions, education and health literacy, health service, personal health practices, and coping skills. Significant findings. The significant findings in our study reveal that socioeconomic, cultural factor, age factor, and education play a vital role. It has been seen that older people have different perceptions regarding their health and care-seeking behavior rather than younger generation people. Still, some senior tribesmen believe in God's supernatural power over the individual. Evil spirits and the worth of God cause some diseases, and they believe in the magical religious treatment for curing their diseases and pray for a better life. Some older people have knowledge related to herbal medicines for curing some specific diseases. The financial constraints makes a profound impact on their health care behaviors. Modern medical treatments are generally used for easily curable diseases and for those diseases which can be cured with pure expenditure. They don't afford modern medicines for those treatments which are highly expensive and for those continue for a longer period. In cases of disease that persist for longer, they either live using medicines or consult local traditional healers for further treatment. Finally, it can be said that the sociocultural aspects, economic condition, education, robust belief system, availability and accessibility of healthcare system are influencing factors of perceiving health and care-seeking behavior among Mankadia people. Then conclusion, people's perception and beliefs about health are interlinked with culture, which is the key determinant factor of health. It does not, uh, not only determined by biological factors, but also by sociocultural factors. Various factors at different levels influence the health status of an individual. In the studied village, it is found that perception of health and disease and their curative method is influenced by sociocultural factors and other factors like education, income, occupation, folk tradition, social network, and geographical location determines the health conditions of people. Here I am concluding my paper. Thank you.
All right, thank you, uh, Rajshree. Uh, so uh, we just, uh, you know, uh, knew about uh, the the various changes made uh, by the tribe and this Mankidia tribe. Uh, so yes. how do you how do you situate, uh, you know, because uh, we can see the hybridized form where they are also adopting the science at large. And on another part, if we just take on the, the first half, they are not ready to embrace the the science right so yes, how do how do you see uh, i mean if we just take a look so how uh, how do you see this tribe different from many other tribes uh, you know because we see there are so many tribes across the country and we can see so we can see they are still you know stuck with their religious belief or with their superstitions where uh, to some extent some are embracing the science at large. How do you see Menkidia tribe different from from uh, this, this this point of uh, context? How do you see that? Because uh, in this tribe, uh, the, the main factor is that uh, uh, conversion into Christianity. After the conversion, they uh, their their perceptions and the presumptions to their health is uh, not superstitious beliefs it uh, they are focusing uh, basically they are focusing in uh, modern medicines like allopathy and some of the uh, uh, older people still now they are uh, who are not converted uh, in christian religion they still now they are uh, they believe in uh, super superstitious beliefs and uh, their treatment is also based on uh, that uh, 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 magic or religious treatment method. All right. Okay. A uh, little bit speculation on the fact, you know, if we just uh, talk about, let us say, uh, belief on science, if we just move towards the allopathy completely. So uh, I, I can believe it can affect our mental health, which they, uh, at um, you know, at uh, earlier time, they used to have um, at at a at, uh, a good extent and that mental health was to large extent better but uh, i think uh, with the, this hybridized form of human beings the things are changing radically and uh, which i believe is also causing uh, strain to the minds which is destroying the men mental health so i'm not sure to what extent it is positive but yes it's it's a, a wonderful paper so thank you thank you rajstri so let us yes, move sir. to our uh, next next uh, uh, presenter, uh, Wazid Aziz. Wazid Aziz. I hope you are there, Wazid. Yes. Wazid, yes. Uh, you can, good evening, you, sir. Good evening, Wazid. Uh, yes, good evening, sir. Am I Yes, you are audible. Uh, sir, my name is Wajid Aziz, uh, research scholar, Department of English, working under the supervision of Dr. Satnam Kaur, University of Jammu. Right. The title of my paper is Negotiating Identity, the Importance of Islam in Leela Abulela's Minaret. Mm -hmm. Leela Abu Leela's second novel, Minaret, published in 2005, establishes her as a formidable writer of real fiction. It's a different kind of fiction. Uh, we can say it's anti-conventional or anti-tradition, <clears throat> a type of Islamic fiction in which the characters' lives and the plots are infused with Islamic ideas and Islamic ideals. The novel follows the spiritual journey of an aristocrat young woman named Najwa who lives in Khartoum with an influential political family. She initially leads a very comfortable life and has Western upbringing, which makes her life easy and effortless. She lives a well-protected and affluent life as part of a powerful and well-connected family. She has a twin brother, Omar, and many westernized friends who help her enjoy her free time at the University of Khartoum. Najwa's life is crushed by a sudden change in Sudan's unbalanced politics brought about by a military coup which forces her family to flee to London. Her father is charged with embezzlement and executed during the uprising. 
such changes brings disaster to Najwa's peaceful life. The absence of her father's care and protection has an economic and social impact on Najwa and her family. Najwa's grief is compounded with her mother, who dies of cancer, and Omar, her only brother, is sentenced to life in prison on drug possession charges. Najwa, as a sensitive and spoiled child, is unable to sustain life in the West and is constantly attempting to adapt to the new world. She tries to build her home in a variety of ways. Her desire for the past is exemplified by her dream, which is filled with love, care, and her value in the family. Anwar, a friend of Khartoum University who seeks political asylum in London, following Sudan's second coup, soon joins her in London. Najwa tries to make her dream a reality by reconnecting with Anwar. He is a leftist who has long despised her father for belonging to a bourgeois class. Najwa hopes to marry to start a family with Anwar in order to rebuild her home and past. But sadly, she fails miserably and ends in a relationship that fills her with only regret and guilt. After many vicissitudes, including the death of her parents and deception, a moment in Lajwa's life occurs when she realizes a space, a sense of freedom. I quote her when she states, Who would care if I become pregnant? Who would be scandalized? Anwar's flatmates, Auntie Eva, Omar, would never know unless I wrote to him. And Uncle Sai, who crosses the word, unquote. <clears throat> changes dramatically after her mother dies of cancer. She realizes the futility of being glamorous, which further detaches Najwa from her mother. This creates a void in her life. She is further troubled by her brother's imprisonment and implores that, as it states, I wish that Umar had been punished the very first time he took drugs, according to Sharia, 100 lashes. It would put him off, protect him from himself. Najwa clearly indicates the importance of Sharia, which could have chastised Umar. She also says, I quote, If Pama had portrayed, I say, if you and I had prayed, all this would have this would not have happened to us. We would have stayed a normal family. Allah would have protected us. If we had asked him to, but we didn't. So we are punished. This understanding imp implants a necessity to seek in her, which becomes instrumental in converting her to as a faithful Muslim. In order to attend peace, Najwa joins a mosque and attended the Islamic lectures. The Quranic verses transforms her, which eventually absolve, absolves her <coughs> all of her mortal burdens. <coughs> so in this regard, Saba Mahmood has aptly says that the lesson in the marks that emphasizes the existence of a divine plan for human life are embodied in the Quran, the exegetical literature and the moral course derived therefrom, that each individual is responsible for the following. Najwa become a <coughs> devout Muslim as a result of her attendance at the mosque, weekly Islamic lectures and classes. Islam, which earlier had no implication in Najwa's life, became her only source of solace. Najwa starts fasting in Ramadan, wearing a veil and offering prayers. Her transformation also represents her opposition to westernization, which she refutes by wearing the veil. The concept of veiling has always been controversial. The veil has also lent her confidence and invisible resisting the male The uh, vital role in impeding virtuistic play and the was it your voice is cracking? Yes. Your voice is cracking. We we can't hear you. Can you? Yes. Uh, we we can't. Hear. Yes, it's it's better. So, it's better now. Yes. Hello, sir. Thank you. Yes. Go on. Go on, uh, please. Sir, yes. should, should I continue? Should, should I continue? Hello, sir. Yes, please go on. Uh, uh, there are many uh, women who oppose this practice, nevertheless defended by other Muslim women. According to them, it's a liberating and helps in finding their individuality. 
I noted Islamic scholar Halfar Asper provides a better opinion in this regard. As a quote her, Islam, Islamist women are particularly defensive of the whale. Many Muslim women have chosen the whale as a symbol of Islamization and have accepted it as the face of their rivalist position. For them, the whale is liberating, not a oppressive force. They maintain that the whale enables them to become the observers and not the observed. That liberates them from the dictates of the fashion industry and demands of the beauty myth. In the context of patriarchy that shapes women's lives, the whale is a means of bypassing sexual harassment and gaining respect. Unquote. It clearly indicates that whale helps women to dodge objectification. But whale as a tool of resistance to patriarchy and westernization is only one dimension of its many meanings. It's important to fix the connotation of wheel which can vary depending on the socio-economic and cultural context and can mean a variety of things. If it is seen as a symbol of liberation, it is perceived as a sign of oppression too. For example, for Lamia and Rwanda, the other characters in the novel, Islam is outdated and veil and old-fashioned practice. Asma Barlas comments that, I quote, oppressive and backward, especially with respect to women, is because of the presumptuous equal equality that West offers and thus there is a struggle for women's empowerment within the Islamic framework. Abu Layla demystifies such notions regarding Islam by an independent Arab woman who wears a veil, follows Islam, is independent. Leila M. traces the road of the whale and argues that the practice of wearing a whale existed even before the pre-Islamic time and wasn't primarily introduced by Islam. She explains that before Islam, it represented the social status of women. She refers to Samaritan civilization, for example, which directs women of honorable household to cover themselves while slaves were prohibited from whaling. She adds that, I quote, the whale is nowhere mentioned in the Quran, which only instructs women to, we to wear it modestly, unquote. Najwa's fondness for the whale is evident from the beginning of the novel. Her strange attraction to provincial girls to entops with their modest grace is the novel's first example or half <coughs> proximity towards whale. The latent faith in Najwa's is expressed when she scolds Randa, who makes fun of university girls wearing the whale. In the novel, it is critical to recognize that accepting ignorance is more significant than experiencing guilt. Najwa recognizes her ignorance and sets out a journey to learn the Quran by enrolling in Islamic class at the London Marks. Najwa finds peace in the mosque and meets other Muslim women. The formation of Uma is one of the striking aspects of the novel. Muslim women in the novel blend their ethnic, cultural, and racial differences to generate what is known as Uma. They develop a bond based on their faith in Allah, which allows them to share the Quran's important lessons, which has always been hidden due to the misrepresentation of verses in the Islamic writings. As a noted Islamic feminist, uh, Amina Wadud says in her book, Quran and Women, reading the sacred text from the woman's perspective. This congregation is effective and is founded on the shared belief in Allah, who does not discriminate based on wealth, ethnicity, sex, or historical context, but on the basis of taqwa. <clears throat> Islamic feminists have made strong demand for unity in order to create a gathering to discuss Islamic values. The way lets Najwa overcoming her differences and uniting with Umar. When she meets unveiled women, Woman at Lamia's park is alienated, indicating that the whale is more than just a It becomes a tool for a believing woman to shield her from men's instructive gaze. As a result, it adds more depth to the whale, which hides the vast, uh, vast disparities between Muslim women and creates an uncanny similarity, the trust in one God. Now I may conclude. Therefore, the minaret can be considered a study of Islamic values or tropes in the lives of Muslim women who follows the authentic teaching of Quran in order to establish their identities. Najwa maintains her sanity in a strange, hostile environment with the aid of her faith. And Abu Layla thus announces the existence of Umar, global democratic community of believers, and its assistance to 
immigrant female characters the islamic ideals that najwa discovers through her understanding of the quran in the mosque sends a message to all muslim women about how they should become independent abul ela also outlines some of the critical concerns that men stream feminism need to address in order to create a global moment for women's emancipation regardless of diversity she highlights the requirement of deep understanding the variety of concerns and problems of women's space in the modern world thank you sir thank you wazit uh, just uh, uh, it was a wonderful presentation so uh, just a uh, you know a uh, a uh, little uh, thing you just said uh, you know being observed and uh, you know uh, and observing right so having contextualized it uh, through the context of you know uh, from veil vale, let us say at large it's not about any specific uh, i'm not talking uh, uh, with special reference to islam so if we, even if we just talk about hinduism so we can see uh, you know the the women using uh, this gungat uh, in fact in many of the uh, uh, you know states of northern india gungat in rajasthan or let us say in haryana himachal pradesh in some parts of himachal pradesh so uh, how do you uh, how can how can we just say that you know women under veil is not observed is not observed uh, she is observed uh, from you know uh, specific Yes. So, so actually, how, is it possible uh, to say this? Exactly, sir. Uh, so first yes, of all, so. if we uh, look at the po uh, so position of women, if we look uh, um, with different perspectives, if we uh, uh, look women, uh, condition of women uh, through the perspective of Orientalism or through the perspective of post-colonialism. so there emerges sir uh, some independent identities that needs to you know natives tries to shape their identity what west what west has dictated them through the discourses or uh, through their ideas uh, of beauty and through their ideas of fashion through their ideas of modernization uh, there are ample amount of examples that women have excelled even you in know, these conditions if we look my question is my question is when we talk about let us say uh, women uh, you know without veil not being uh, with without uh, veil being observed and without and with veil she is not you know being observed so uh, how do you contextualize it uh, i mean just that is little bit you know a uh, little bit intriguing because uh, the one who is putting on veil is also being observed from some particular kind of context right and one who is putting it on one who is not putting it on both the the, the faces are being observed so how can we say you know uh, that uh, veil is liberating them is it possible to say okay so okay so since uh, there are many source uh, you know one drives uh, his strength or uh, or we can say the essence of life uh, through morality and ethics it cannot be denied and the religion plays a vital role in this regard uh, we cannot deny that uh, the people who are not wearing veil are adhering to this uh, uh i can say to these traditions are not observed they are also being observed but mm -hmm. every person is um, uh, since we are discussing novel it's it's uh, leela laabad minaret and its arab civilization and it is majorly known mm -hmm. for its islamic traditions and uh, uh they are observed in such context that uh, they are easily you know uh, uh, called by the west they they are not uh, uh, civilized they are barbaric and uh, uh, mm -hmm. and women is not progress to in this regard so women are shaping their identity by driving strength i can say from their traditions and from their religion and uh, they are shaping their lives accordingly all right thank you very much thank you okay thank you was it okay so uh, i think we have our uh, first speaker also with us uh, shraddha i think she has joined 
Thank you, yes, was it? Right. It was wonderful paper, uh, but I think there is a you know little bit need of elaboration on on a point where when we just you know try to see the things from one particular point of view where we say that some someone under the veil is not observed so that person is again setting some kind of tradition towards the fact one who is not putting on the veil so it is you know changing the dimensions and again putting another kind of identity to which you you've been trying to dislocate exactly right exactly. so i think exactly right, right. so i think uh, that right okay so next uh, uh, we move to uh, our, our last speaker uh, is shraddha hello yes hello, she's sorry, going, she has a uh, very interesting yes very interesting uh, novel which she has chosen season of flight uh, she is a research scholar uh, in department of english and cultural studies mizoram university Right. Okay, so you can go ahead. The novel is written by Manjushri Thapa, and she's been looking looking at Nepali diaspora. All right. So yes, please go ahead, Shraddha. Hello, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Hello. Yes, you are uh, audible. Yes, you can sir. begin with your paper. Hello. Yes, Shraddha, uh, are we audible to you or not? Yes, yes, sir. So sorry, sir. Yes, uh, actually, my you can begin the presentation. Yes, you can begin your presentation, right? Sir, is this visible? Uh no your presentation is not visible yet hello yes sir is this visible uh your presentation is not visible if if possible you can read out uh, if if possible you can read out your paper sir i think it's visible now is it visible to anybody else because i can't see it no sir it's not visible ma'am your screen is not it's... visible can you uh, present once again Okay, I'm so sorry for this. You can share your screen. I think there is option for sharing the screen, and through that you can present. Yes, I think. Yeah. I think. Uh, right through that, it will be visible. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's it's, okay, it's visible now. Yeah. Yes, it's now. Now it's visible, sir. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry for this inconvenience. Um. So uh, today my presentation is on seasons of flight and interpretation of Nepali diaspora by Manjushri Thapa. Um, first of all, the paper focuses on all of this, uh, which I will be dealing it. Um, and the overview of my paper is uh, introduction, the economic migration and age old tradition of Nepal, nostalgia and memory, alienation both in Nepal and the hostland, culture, hybridity and transform identity. Uh, first of all, uh, the book Seasons of Light was published in the year 2010 by the Elk Book Company in New Delhi, India. And the paper, uh, the book itself is divided into 30 chapters. And the setting of the story moves back and forth to Nepal and America. Being a diaspora writer, Manjushri Thapa evokes and discusses the dilemma and emotional turmoil of Nepali diaspora. The book focuses on the transnational identity of a Nepali immigrant, Prema, who moves to the United States of America from Nepal, uh, who was uh, selected through a green card lottery. Um, through Prema's situation, Thapa represents the lives of millions of Nepali migrant workers and immigrants who have to deal with harsh situations in their new land. Thus, uh, due to the intermingling with new culture and place has played a crucial role in the changes and exchanges of various ways uh, Nepalese in contemporary times. Uh, 
considered as one of the leading contemporary diasporic voices of Nepal, like many other diasporic writers, Manjushri Thapa's writing style is simple and straightforward, and most of her works provide just enough detail to lend authenticity to the story setting. Uh, Seasons of Flight, the book itself, creates the plight of people in a diaspora who are in search of their identity. Every chapter in the book presents the adventure of Prema's survival in two worlds, that is Nepal and America, a, a similar subject presented by prominent Indian diaspora writers in which um, the sense of longing for their motherland is the overwhelming sentiment for them. The book is therefore a global concern, afflicted with the problems of immigrants, migrant workers, refugees and all other exiles. Um, so this is uh, Kevin Kenny in Diaspora, a very short introduction of Diaspora. I will not read it out. Um, moving on to the next slide, which is economic migration, an age-old tradition of Nepal. The term Diaspora uh, can have different meanings and implications. Um, and uh, in Nepal, the scarcity of employment and equal opportunities along with the higher intensity of war has motivated migration to other regions and other nations from decades. Tracing back to the past, economic migration has been adopted by the Nepalese for their livelihood, which has therefore become a culture and a way of life in contemporary times. It has thus helped and plays a significant role in building the nation Nepal and the economic stability of an individual. Um, Prema, uh, because of the political conflicts and economic underdevelopment, migrates and struggles to build her life in a foreign land. Manjushri Thapa, though Prema's, through Prema's life, uh, brings out the tale of millions of misplaced identities who chose to migrate because of the lack of opportunities and who are tormented by the constant turmoil within their own land. And uh, fictional narratives of migrating or settling in a foreign nation shows a picture of the real world of contemporary Nepal. Migration has therefore become a trend within the Nepali household and has become the source of economic stability for many in contemporary Nepal. Migration, especially economic migration, therefore has opened the path to creating the process of globalization and in the context of Nepal, the political environment characterized by repeated strikes, unemployment, social hierarchy, and social pressures to migrate has a psychological effect on an individual to decide to migrate on a certain level. Moving on to the next uh, topic, nostalgia and memory. Uh, what mainly comes under the diasporic scrutiny is the complex experience of migrancy, encompassing both cultural hybridization and assimilation on the one hand and lingering nostalgia and cultural alienation on the other. The nostalgia and memory of Prema's past in Nepal was always connected with the harsh lives she and her family had in her in the two-storied stone house in the village. At the backdrop of the story, the disaster caused by the massive earthquake and the uproaring of the Maoists were the major reasons behind the poverty of Nepal. Prema, only after going college to the capital city of Nepal, Kathmandu, she had, here I quote, discovered that her family had been poor. And her decision to leave uh, Nepal therefore highlight the same condition of millions of Nepalese every year. And uh, Alienation bought in Nepal in the Horseland. Um, the book uh, Seasons of Flight testifies uh, Manjushri Thapa's authentic experiences as well as her clear mastery of the technique of fictionalizing the outer reality of the lives of the Nepalese in contemporary times. Discontent with the situation in Nepal, as an author, Thapa gives voice on the heavily uh, distorted, dismantled, disturbed, and trapped lives of the Nepalese in Nepal, as well as people from uh, Nepalese from uh, other countries. So in the process of her growth and change in a foreign land, Prema is faced with conflict between rebellion and acceptance. And this conflict forms the underlying tension in the book. Uh, so Prema began to felt um, alienation in the changing atmosphere and adjusting with new culture. Uh, this is quoted from the text. Uh, Prema says, I do not have a world, Prema cried, I left the world I had and do not belong in the one I am in now, your world. Moving on to the next slide, um, cultural hybridity and transform identity. 
As Prema began to experience new cultures and meet new people, she finally takes crucial decision of her life independently while supporting her family back in Nepal. And for this, she resists numerous social and cultural restrictions and obligations which gradually transform her as an independent woman of the 21st century. Her transformation process, uh, therefore, emphasizes on transformation in perception, material reality, and human relationship in resistant process. Despite her failing attempt to control and manage her situation, Prema gradually accepted her diaspora situation at the end. And uh, in the concluding part, um, Prema's life revolves around from a village girl to a grown woman to be more precise in her emotional and psychological state. And here Manjushri Thapa highlights how her life, Prema's life, her thinking and her behavior changes along with the change in time and place. Uh, to a large degree, uh, no culture remains pure after an encounter with another. A change and shift in views and lifestyles inculcate auto automatically. And um, at the end, I would like to close with uh, Baba's The Location of Culture, in which Baba writes that the notion that any culture or identity is pure or essential is disputable. As such, one must be aware of the dangers of fixity and fetishism of identities, since all forms of culture, here are quote, all forms of culture are continually in the process of hybridity. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Shrata. So, uh, yes, so it was also, you know, uh, a wonderful paper where it's it's been talking about the trauma, emotional trauma uh, faced by yes, the corrector sir. and how, you know, that, how does she get displaced from, in fact, from her identity and the longingness for, for her, her native state, you know, uh, native country shows uh, the dislocation and how it keeps on haunting when she you know reaches on an, on a land where no one actually is aware of her situation so on one part we can just say that you know it's it's been dealing with the emotional trauma on another part it's nostalgia the diasporic nostalgia and yes so uh, it's it's a wonderful paper okay so that is all i think uh, uh, it, it was wonderful convers uh, presentation by you. So anybody question with any anyone else? Any presenter wants to, you know, inquire or ask any questions. So we invite the questions from all the all the speakers, also all the presenters. Yes. Marcy Philip. Yes. Yes, sir. I just want to ask uh, some uh, some information from a Dajistry scholar. Uh, she was speaking about the traditional beliefs and uh, especially on health. And uh, also, I heard that they also use traditional medicines. So I, just, I was just thinking because in my own setup here, I have seen the tribals developing their traditional knowledge of medicine into a uh, very scientific type of uh, method that they combine, they go get really well trained in herbal medicines in a good um, places and they combine, can combine both modern and uh, traditional knowledge and they set up uh, good centers for themselves so that people are not alienated from that tra traditional knowledge of uh, medicines and it is preserved. So do this particular group have such kind of some set up for encouragement to build up their own centers along with their traditional knowledge of medicines. Yes, Daishri, you have a question from Marcy. Marcy, hello. Oh. Uh. She's asking, she is inquiring. Yes, yes, is talking about you know the, the ayurvedic medicine and how the allopathic has you know replaced it and how both the medicines can get can go together and how they can help uh, our mental health i'm sure this is your question mercy yes yeah? sir. Yes. Yes, 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 sir. Sir. yes sir yes sir yes sir 
actually uh, that tribe is uh, basically in uh, when uh, in traditional tribe in ancient period their uh, traditional medicine is that uh, they are use herbal medicines but still now uh, the they are not uh, engaging in that uh, they don't want to that uh, develop their indigenous medicines and uh, many of the people are uh, going uh, outside so that they uh, outside work or uh, they they did not uh, go to forest uh, and they did not collect uh, that uh, herbal medicines but some of the older generation peoples are going there the, continuing their work but uh, they they have not such type of satisfaction that uh, uh, developing in that uh, indigenous medicines uh, so uh, still now uh, in my observation is uh, there that uh, uh, i observed that in that area uh, many people, I mean, younger generations told that uh, we, when uh, we feel sick then we used uh, uh, sometimes of uh, we used allopathic medicines and uh, um, in some uh, sometimes they also use uh, herbal medicines uh, uh, when the, uh, from taking uh, pres uh, prescribed by their local healers that uh, um, uh, in some of the diseases like uh, uh, hormonal disbalance uh, from where they they are not satisfied in allopathic medicine uh, both, uh, very rarely they using that uh, herbal types of medicines because I think most of the people nowadays believe in, uh, you know, quick recovery and for for that they just look for the shortcuts. I think to which allopathy, allopathy helps. No one wants to go for uh, yes. natural and slow process. So which is, I think, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why Ayurveda is also, you know, losing its footprints, I believe. Yes, that can also be the reasons. One of them. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They thought that uh, that uh, herbal medicine is not uh, working uh, um, properly. I'm uh, saying that's, that. That's, that's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, so that I think it is not uh, this. Uh, those tra uh, traditional healers are not trained. Also, they just with their traditional knowledge, they just give. Unless someone needs yeah, to train them and uh, connect it to the Ayurvedic or some other uh, modern type of trade, converting into something which is uh, better than what they had been doing at the same time, preserving their identity of uh, having that such kind of traditional knowledge. Yeah, they don't have. Uh, uh, I got the, in that area. I observed that uh, only one local healer is there. Uh, that uh, he uh, he prescribes some of some medicine. But uh, the people of Mankadia in that village did not prefer uh, uh, that herbal medicines. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, with, with this, uh, yes, any other question from anybody? All right, so with this, I will sum it up. Uh, you know, so we just got paper uh, from, you know, uh, we got paper from different fields and uh, Mercy spoke about the, the, the you know, the uh, Morang tradition and how it's been, you know, declining in, in with the passage of time. Uh, we also, uh, you know, uh, saw her, uh, insistence on Sumi tribe, right? So after that, we just uh, got to know about uh, the paper presented by Rajshri. So she spoke on the uh, health and especially uh, the context through which she's been speaking on the 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 science as well as allopathy. And she also talked about the tribe, the Menkidia tribe, how it's been following the allopathy as well as uh, ayurveda so how it has been you know uh, moving and how it has also been tr trying to some extent embrace the the slow the gradual process the slow process uh, of of medicine and how it's been uh, you know playing its role for mental health then we had a paper from um, uh, wazid he presented uh, on the paper on the importance of islam and how does uh, uh, you know, Lela Ablila uh, Minarets, the novel which, you know, 
how does it uh, try to empower women by just following you know the the islamic traditions and how does it uh, uh, you know situate the the identity of women uh, from from religious perspective so he is also deliberated upon it and lastly we had a paper from shada where she uh, you know spoke on nepali diaspora right so and she discussed on the the emotional trauma the the uh, you know so with this i thank all the all the presenters and uh, i congratulate you for your wonderful presentation so thank you very much so with thank this you. i i thank, thank you, the organizer thank also you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, uh, thank you for uh, sharing sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of Holy Cross College in Agar Koyil, once again I thank you. Your presence really made this session an interesting one. Thank you so much, sir.